All right, good to see you guys here tonight as we continue in the Psalms. Tonight we're going to be in Psalm 95, so you can go, go there straight away. Um, again, as when we started the Psalms, you know, we spoke to really the two primary themes throughout the Psalms. I mean, there are a lot of things that are going on, but the two primary themes are, 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 are trusting God and then the praise and worship of God. And Psalm 95 is no exception to this. So, in fact, in here in Psalm 95, the psalmist will give us actually a differentiation between the act of praise and the act of worship because they can be different. And, uh, and again, the primary differences being approach and attitude to either praising or worshiping or the combination of the two. And he also gives us many reasons for the praise and worship of God. What he is the one true God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is God of creation and for the care he provides his people. All these reasons we have to praise and worship God. But then the psalmist does something really interesting. He closes with an ominous warning about staying in tune with God in the moment today. About hearing the voice of God. Not allowing the hardening of our hearts through sin and unbelief which can keep us from experiencing the rest of God. So it's interesting how the psalmist will go through these very edifying and uplifting experiences, and then he ends with, again, this ominous, this ominous warning. Right? But even in this warning, for that too, that warning that he gives us, God should be praised for that too. He praised in worship for his warnings towards us. Because he only gives us these things because he loves us. That's why he does it, right? So let's, let's start off by reading the psalm at the very beginning. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the God, for the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion is in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We're going to start off in verses 1 and 2, but go ahead and flip to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 16 because we're going to use the verses out there. So while you're going to 1 Chronicles, I'll read read the first two verses. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. This is a call to worship. That we would make a joyful, a joyful noise to God. First Chronicles 16, 1 through 11. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And here's the good part. <laughs> and he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, to praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and next to him, Zechariah, then Jeel, then Shir Miramah, Jael, you know, if you read these really fast, it doesn't matter how you pronounce them. Okay. <laughs> Continuing, and he goes, Jill with stringed instruments and harps. But Asaph made music with cymbals. Mm-hmm. Benaiah and Jahaziel, 
the priest regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. And on that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and to his brethren to thank the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who rejoice, who seek the Lord, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face forevermore. You know what David just did there? He said, let's put a worship team together and make a joyful noise. And that's exactly what they did. Or to quote Jake Elwood, we're getting the band back together. We're on a mission from God. Right? Sing to him, sing songs to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory to his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. And you know what? That's why we stand when we worship. Because that is exactly what we are doing. It's exactly what we do. It's the way we start. <laughs> One of the most beautiful things that we ever see in our lives and one of the most beautiful things we ever hear is that of a congregation of his people standing and praising God at the top of their voices. You know what it's like? I mean, really. really and for us, it's a worship team. We get to see you. We get to see it. We get to experience it in its fullness. And, you know, and we know uh, we disappear out of here. You guys are embracing God as you stand and as you worship. We become as nothing. We're instruments. We're the cymbals. We're the horns that are going off. What? Leading all of us into the presence of God. There is nothing more beautiful than to walk into a church service and hear people praising God. And have you ever walked by a church when their doors were open? No, seriously. Randomly. Walk by a church when the doors are open and hear the praises of God come out of that door. It is incredible. I think when the weather's nice, that door should be propped open. I mean, we should be sharing our praise and worship with all our neighbors. We should do this. Not in July. <laughs> but we should do this. Oh, come. <laughs> Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. And then it says, to the rock of our salvation. Of course, we know the rock... Speaks of being solid and movable, unbreakable, and on something on which we can depend. Salvation for the psalmist primarily was really around being delivered from his enemies, but we know that salvation, there, there is eternity in salvation. And we can say the rock of our salvation, Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost to those who come to God through him. Uttermost means this, that is forever and completely with full assurance. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We can stand on the rock of our salvation. Verse 3. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all God. He is just not a great God. He is the great God. He is the great king above all gods. First Chronicles 16, again, 23 through 34. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day, declaring his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. He is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. 
Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Then the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And we say it again, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord has made the heavens. Which is a wonderful segue in the verses 4 and 5. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. So what we see here is actually the creator God. First we saw the God, the only true and living God. But here we see the creator God. And it is his creation. It belongs to him. And it belongs to him alone. It is his creation. And he says, the scripture says what? That he formed it by his hand. And he holds it, holds it in his hands. He holds it all together. Quoting R.C. Sproul, he said this, there is not one maverick molecule operating outside the sovereign control and direction of God. And as the child like him goes, he holds the whole world in his hand. He holds the whole wide world in his hand. Isaiah 45, 18, for thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. O come and let us worship bow down. And we sang that, that song tonight, obviously, intentionally saying that. O come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. This is the second call to worship in, in this song, right? But with a different, a different approach. It's, it's different. Before it, what? Shout for joy. Here, what? Let us worship and let us kneel. Let us bow down. There is praise and there is worship. And they're not mutually exclusive, but at the same time, they do have a different approach and a different attitude. It's a different thing to stand before God and raise your hands and praise him. And it's a different thing to bow and kneel before him and worship. The attitude is a little bit different. The Just the whole feeling and the sense of what we're doing and what we're bringing to God. Both appropriate, both having equal value, not one more than the other, but yet at the same time being the same, but at the same time being different, right? And apart from being prostrate before God, bowing and kneeling are the most appropriate physical acts of submission before the Lord God, our maker, kneeling and bowing before him. And when I think of kneeling and bowing, I think when I do that, it makes me real small. And he gives him the appropriate place where he needs to be. Because he is almighty God. I need to kneel. I need to bow. Methinks. Actually, I like that word. Methinks. <laughs> Did you know that's one word? <laughs> Methinks this. That often our thoughts of him are too small, making ourselves too big. And... You know, we know this, but we don't know this. But if we really knew how big he is, we would shrink or shrivel before him. And who could stand before him? And yet, as Phil prayed tonight, he, through his son, right, has made a way directly to himself, directly to his throne of grace, enabling, actually enabling us to worship him in spirit and in truth. He gave us the ability to do this. We never had this ability before. Well, it should be 
of having this fear of this awesome and mighty God, he actually says, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain help and mercy in time and need. Worship me in the spirit of truth. You don't have to fear me. I want you to love me. I want you to love me. And then when we sit, when we worship, because we do that too, right? We shout for joy. We praise his name. And then we sit. There's purpose for what we do. And, you know, it's like when to sit down is, is like to settle in. And like sometimes it's like calling it my spiritual couch. Where I get to sit down and rest in God. And I rest in him in worship, right? And to settle in and to be, as it were, to be on the knees of our hearts. On the knees of our hearts. Allowing our hearts to become soft and pliable and our lives vulnerable in intimate worship. Bowing and kneeling. These are submitting willfully as an act of love towards God. When we bow, when we kneel, we are submitting willfully to God as an act of love to God. Submission and worship are acts of love to God. The Lord God, our maker, he is the Lord God. He is our maker. Psalm 139, 14 through 18. For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the low, lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me. When as yet there were none of them, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Do you think of God that way? Do you think of them that way? That when God thinks about you, his thoughts are so many and so good to you, they are more than the sand on the beach. More than we can comprehend. The love of God for us is beyond our understanding. And yet it says here, he made us and he knows us in the most intimate of all levels. He knew the number of our days before we existed. Before you existed, he knew you. And we were always on his mind. Always. His thoughts are precious towards us. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. For he is our God. He is our God. He is your God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The people of his pasture in the Hebrew, it's merif, and it means pasture or feeding. And really what this is speaking to more than anything else is God's care and nurturing of his people. When word means that we're the people of his pasture, that means God is taking care of us. He's taking care of you and he's taking care of me. God has taken the care for us totally upon himself. And we are the sheep of his hand. This is what we know about sheep. Sheep have little to no capacity of taking care of themselves. Right? They require tending. They require feeding. And they require protection. And he calls us his sheep. We are the people, the sheep of his pastor. And we belong to him. This is one of those me thinks thing. Me thinks, me thinks that we completely underestimate the care of God in our lives. We completely underestimate it. And if we're not underestimating, then we are certainly taking it for granted. His care is constant. It's constant and it's unceasing. It never stops. 
protecting us from danger, seen and unseen. You don't know what he did for you today. You don't know. You don't know how he protected you from things you never saw. Providing, here's another, providing direction and the way we should go in our lives, even when we don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. Who's directing your steps? Even as we're stumbling and mumbling and fumbling in your life, who do you think is still, in spite of you, directing your steps? He is completely and totally. And I, I, I'm fully convinced of this. And left to our own, like a sheep without a shepherd, we would surely perish. Without our shepherd, we would perish. You guys get a bonus song tonight. Because you can't read that without going to Psalm 23. You just can't. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember last week? I want to use this last week. You know why? Because we talked about going into the valley, right? The, the dredger, the chambers talked about that. And I wanted to use that, the valley of the shadow of death, right? And then the final part, though, that we were on a journey. We're on a journey, and there's a destination in our journey. And here it is. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our destination. That's our destination. Let's go to verse 7c. I kind of split them up there, and there, there's a reason for that. Just this one, one little thing here. Today, if you will hear his voice, and, and I, I, I say this a lot. It's not original, but I say this a lot. Today is the operative word for us, for believers. Today is the operative word, quoting Spurgeon. This is the uniform time intense of the Holy Ghost exhortations. He saith nothing about tomorrow except to forbid our boasting of it. Since we know not what a day shall bring forth, all his instructions are set to the time and tune of today today, today. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And then Romans 13, 11. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is near than when we first believe today, today, today. You know, we lived in Australia for a couple years, and, and we were there. We we we, had, we were so fortunate. We were so blessed, and had this incredible experience. That we got to travel all over Asia Pacific, all those really neat cities: Tokyo, Seoul, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Sydney, just all over the place. But the one thing I knew when we were doing all these travels, and I would tell Nadine, I go, you know, one day this gig's coming to an end. It's, this ain't gonna last forever, right? And and we need to treat, we need to treat every day like it'll be the last day that we're going to stay here. Because you know what? Ultimately that last day came. And you know what, Saints, we need to treat today like it will be the last day that we will be here, right? Because yesterday is totally gone. The future is promised to nobody today, right here, right now. This moment, this moment, 
is all we have. It, it is all you have. When you walk out that door, you do not know. You do not know. This, this is it. We live in this moment with God. We live in this moment with God. You know, some may say like it's the first day of the, you know, what do they say? They say this is the first day of the rest of your life. But it also might be the last day of what is left of your life. Luke 12, 18 through 20. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, I wonder if it's the soul that talks back when he does it. Soul, I will say to my soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night, your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which that you have provided? Fool. Today, today, if you hear his voice. This is all also a pretty interesting transitional verse because it moves us from this submissive worship, from the worship of God, to listening for his voice, and then ultimately to not hardening our hearts, and we'll talk about more on that later. But let's look at worship and hearing his voice, just, just for a second. So when we do this submissive worship to God, when we bow before him, you know what this does? It prepares our hearts to hear the voice of God. The intimate worship of God does what? It softens our heart so that we can hear from God. When I say that we have purpose in our services, in the order of our services, we always start with worship. And one of the primary reason is because he is worthy of our praise. But the other reason for that is our hearts need to be softened. We need to wash the world out of this. As we sit before here in him, when we worship, it softens us. What? So that we're prepared for this. So that we're prepared to hear from him. We worship him. It puts us in a different place. It takes the world away from us. Everything we do in our services have meaning, they have value, and they have purpose. Verses 8 and 9. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. Do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. And let's get this settled. A hardened heart is rebellion. A hardened heart is rebellion. The scripture is also rendered, do not harden your hearts as in Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness. Meribah means strife and contention. And Massa means trial and testing. Go to Exodus chapter 17. Because I'm not going to talk about this, what happened. We're going to read about what happened. I'd rather listen to scripture than me anyway. Exodus chapter 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camp and refit them. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? And why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I stand before you there on the rock and hoard. And you shall strike the rock and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. 
So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So we actually get to see that actual event that actually took place that brought about this. What? Do not harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion. That was the day of the rebellion. And then where your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. These guys, these guys, right? All the striving, always causing contention, always complaining, always whining. All this sniveling, they were a bothersome lot. If you sat through Phil's study for all those weeks, this is all these what these guys did the whole time. They just complained. That's all they complained, complained, complained. You know, my family golf tournament at the end of July every year, you knew we were gonna get to a golf story, right? So at my family golf tournament at the end of July every year, and this year being our 31st year, isn't that amazing? 31st year we've done this. There are a list of rules. There are a lot of rules. Because Norton's like imposing the will on people. Just, but, but, speak up. Rule number one. No sniveling. No sniveling. That is rule number one. And as you go through all the other rules that are on there, if you don't like that rule, refer to rule number one. No sniveling. And at the Norton Law Familia, this is the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not snivel. Right? The children of Israel constantly tested and tried God, complaining and sniveling, even though they saw his work. Even though they saw his work. And what was his work? What? The plagues in Egypt. The angel of death and the Passover. The deliverance out of Egypt, completely out of Egypt, where they were enslaved. The parting of the Red Sea so they could get across and get away from Pharaoh, where, where God destroyed Pharaoh, right? And then sustenance in the wilderness, water from the rock, manna from heaven. And eventually, eventually, God actually showing his presence, his very presence, through smoke and fire in the tabernacle. All of that, right? I mean, how much more did they need to see that they would be forever ungrateful, forever complaining? Nothing would ever be good enough for these guys. You ever meet someone like that? Somebody? Always complain. Always complain, right? Nothing's ever good enough. And no one will ever measure up to like that person's standards, no matter how good it is anything that God does will never be good enough for the hard heart verses 10 and 11 for 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest so God speaks for 40 years. This is God talking, right? For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. And grieved means to be disgusted, angry, and here's a word, loathed. I mean, how would you like to be loathed? I mean, <laughs> these are harsh words. that God talking about these people, right? For 40 years, God was not happy with these guys. And that's a long time. But that is nothing compared with his grief, his disgust, and his anger and his loathing for all of mankind. They go astray in their hearts. They do not know my way. Spurgeon, their heart, speaking of that generation, their heart was obstinately and constantly at fault. It was not their head which erred. But their very heart was perverse. They did not know his ways. It means he, they did not know or follow his laws and statutes. They were given instruction meant for their very care and well-being. The instruction and guidance of God is not arbitrary, random, or haphazard. 
but always with purpose. And by the way, always having the best in mind for its people. That's why he gives us instruction. But here it is. Moreover, they saw his work. And this work was also the very care and guidance of God for themselves. He took care of them through all that. But their hearts were hardened. And the heart is the heart of the problem. And then he says, I swore my, la my wrath. The last thing, the last thing we would ever do, and we know this as believers, the last thing we would ever want to be is an object of God's wrath. You know what? But God had had enough with that hard-hearted and rebellious generation. And the day will come when God has had enough with this hard-hearted and rebellious generation. Psalm 103, 8 through 9 the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. They shall not enter my wrath, my rest, excuse me. With wrath becomes judgment. With wrath comes judgment. Numbers 14. A bit of a long reading, but... It's, it's worth reading. Numbers 14, starting in verse 1. And so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept at night, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us into the land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Why... It not be better for us to return to Egypt. So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones, now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord says to Moses, How long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of you a nation greater, mightier than they. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it. For by your might, you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard your fame will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land, which he swore to give to him. Therefore, he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt, even unto now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him to the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. 
Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. They shall know the land which you have despised. According to the number of days which you spied out of the land, 40 days, each of you shall bear the guilt of one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. With wrath comes judgment. They did not enter into his rest. A final comment from Spurgeon on this. There can be no rest to an unbelieving heart. If manna and miracles could not satisfy Israel, neither would they have been content with the land which flowed with milk and honey. So this is a really interesting way to, to, to finish this psalm. First, it starts off as we describe the praise and worship, declaring the glory of God, God as creation, the care for his people. You know, it really was uplifting and edifying, but then the psalm ends with that very stern and ominous warning about not hardening our hearts. So, so how do we reconcile these things and kind of, bring them in harmony. So, so we start from the beginning. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. Let us come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Let us always start with the praise and worship of God. And here is the most important part. Always remembering to whom we are singing. Spurgeon again. It is to be feared that very much, even of religious singing, is not unto the Lord, but unto the ear of the congregation. Above all things, we must, in our service of song, take care that all we offer with the heart sincerest and most fervent intent is directed toward the Lord himself. We have an audience of one in our praise and worship. For the Lord is a great God, the great God, King and Creator. He is the great God. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the Creator of all things. By his word, he breathed them into existence. By his hand, he formed them. And by his hand, he holds them all together. Isaiah 40, 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatest of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. And then he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. And I always find it best to let Jesus, Jesus himself do the talking. John 10, 11 through 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, who does not know the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. They will be one flock and one shepherd. And Jesus has done what? As our good shepherd, he has laid down his life for us. 
and he knows you, and now you know him. He is our good shepherd, and he will do what? He will take you all the way to that day when we see him face to face. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. And then he says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Remember today being the operative word for the believer. There should always be a sense of urgency for us, as Spurgeon said, today, today, today. And to hear his voice. The world, the enemy, the flesh can easily drown out that still small voice. And the worship of God is one of the best silencers of that noise. The submissive worship of God with being on the knees of our hearts, softening our hearts and preparing our hearts to hear the voice of God. This is one of the reasons we worship. And then he says, not to, do not harden your heart. Ezekiel 26, or 36, 26 and 28. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land with that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So God, for us as believers, has done what? You sang a song the other night about this. He has removed that heart of stone and he's given us a heart of flesh. He has actually made us soft towards him. One of the best words I have ever received in my life, one of the best words I've ever received came from an old friend of mine, a pastor and a brother in the Lord, named Don Thomas. I've talked about him before. But one time he said to me, and very simply said this, he goes, you know what, Skip? Stay soft. Just that, two words. Stay soft. This, this is a good word. Stay soft. And then entering into his rest. Real quick, last time around here, go to Hebrews real quick. We won't read all of this because it's a lot. But actually, this Hebrews chapter 3, verses uh, 7, all the way to chapter 4, verse 11. It's quite a bit there, but it's actually one of the most... Um, and accurate's not quite the right word, but verbatim, verbatim use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. And it starts actually in... in, in, in uh, in verse 7 of, okay, let me get there real quick. I, and this is important. This is really, really important. Verse 7 in chapter 3. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit is saying it here in Hebrews, and he also said it, also said it in the Old Testament. It's the same Holy Spirit. God himself is spoken. And again, regarding the hardening of the heart for the believer, you know, just picking out certain verses, uh, chapter 3, 12 through 13. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, right? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin always hardens the heart of God. There is no rest in sin. Sin is exhausting to the soul. And so what the scripture admonishes us to do, to do what? Let us exhort one another daily, stay soft. I'm exhorting you, stay soft, right? And then regarding the hardened heart of the unbeliever, chapter four, verses two and three, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But listen to this, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we have believed, do enter that rest. And as he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Why did they not enter into his rest? This word which they heard did not profit them. Why not being mixed with faith? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. They had no faith, only hard and unbelieving hearts. We enter into the rest of God by faith and by faith alone. It's the only way we get there. It's in Ephesians, kind of wrapping this up, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. i got to read this whole thing. I'm not going to cut this short. And you he made alive, who are dead in trespasses and sins, 
in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. We enter into his rest. We enter into his rest by grace through faith alone. We are kept in his rest by grace and through faith alone. Therefore, there remains a rest for the people of God. Stay soft, saints. Stay soft. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you call us to this place to praise and worship you. You've given us the capacity to worship you in spirit and in truth. And you also tell us just how great you are through your creation, that you are the God above all other gods. There are no other gods. And then you tell us that, you know what? You are a shepherd. You take care of us. You love us completely. Your thoughts towards us are precious. But you also give us warning not to harden our hearts. Listen today. Listen today. You admonish us. We'll have to stay close to you, to not allow our flesh or anything to harden our hearts where our relationship with you would, would be hindered in any way. So help us, Lord, we pray. Help us, Lord, that we would stay soft. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Shall we stand? <laughs>